Lots of shit happened this month. Like I finally learned what Kawasaki's disease is, and why I got it when I was three. I also learned that the reason I had been having so many health problems is because of these two little fuckers right here. Coronary artery left and coronary artery right. Oh, you wanna go for a walk around the block, do you? Well, you ain't doing that shit, fella. Better sit your ass down and watch reruns of The Simpsons until your brain stops working. When I was a kid, I got Kawasaki's disease. It causes aneurysms in your arteries. I didn't know that until I saw a 3D representation of my heart with my doctor saying this is most likely going to mean open heart surgery. 100% calcification of both aneurysms, no blood getting through. I had a decision to make at that point. I could go home and think about shit or let the doctors crack me open like an Alaskan crab and dig around in my chest. It was a difficult decision, I'm not going to lie, because I had no idea what I was in for. On one hand, I could seek out another opinion. Maybe there was a doctor out there willing to stint my heart in a less invasive way, but see, I knew that was the coward in me. I opted for surgery without thinking because it was the only way I could move forward without dragging my feet. So bam, I'm admitted to the hospital. The first round of shit was testing. Then came the day of the surgery and I'm nervous because I'm signing shit like living wills and telling the hospital what my surrogate can and cannot do in case I'm incapacitated. Yo, but I'm not gonna lie, that shit got real in those moments. <sighs> shit. When I woke up from general anesthesia, I still had a tube down my throat. I panicked and cried in pain as the painkillers had not yet kicked in. I even tried to pull the tube out on my own. My family had to hold me down as I kicked and thrashed. They put me under again, and when I woke up, all that remained in me were tubes through my chest, four to be exact, running down into little plastic collection devices, and this feeling that my every breath was labored and painful. The day was long and boring and lonely in the ICU. That first day, two of the tubes were removed from between my mid-ribs. The procedure was executed thusly. A tiny nurse, no more than 90 pounds, gripped the tubes within a towel inside of both hands and counted down for me to breathe in deeply on the count of three. One, two, three. <gasps> and as I held, I felt the tubes slither their way out of my lungs with a sensation that I can only describe as having your guts torn out. I laid in a recliner, catching my breath, as she sewed up the purse string sutures and tried to think of something else besides the pain or the fact that I felt like something very vital had been removed from me. The coming days have been nothing but pain and small steps towards recovery. Sleeplessness and boredom are my everyday and that hasn't changed since I was released from the hospital. And the oxycodone was making my dreams a vivid hellscape from which I would wake from every hour wondering what new hell the drug would have waiting for me when I next closed my eyes only to find the original hell repainted with gloss and a slight twist. I spent many long, boring hours staring up at the ceiling. Would I have made this choice if I knew it was so hard? If I had to do it again, would I lay down and die? I thought about a lot of different choices I could have made, and how, even though that choice was difficult, I still made it. And one of the things that got me thinking really surprised me. Why has everyone forgotten about Outer Worlds? And was it a boring game? Nah, bitch, what the fuck are you talking about? It wasn't was it amazing? Nah. So what's that make the game then? Just mediocre? Ugh, I mean, I hate to say it, but yeah, pretty much. But why? Like the shooting was good, right? Yeah, it was alright. The dialogue was well written and funny. Yeah, it was pretty decent. Is this French? I can't fucking read French. The quest design had lots of choices and had surprising outcomes, right? Nah, 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 nah. Hold up, Scrappy-Doo. Okay? The quest design was just alright. It didn't hold any surprises. Like, we were all excited for this shit, right? I mean, it was from the people who made New Vegas and it had the look and feel and humor of old Fallout games. It should have been great instead of being aggressively okay. Then they signed a deal with Epic and all the hype on this game just stopped. The reviews rolled in. Tens, nines, eights. The game ended up with a 85 on Metacritic, which means it was probably like a 6.5 in any other scoring system. Everyone seemed to like it, but unlike with Fallout New Vegas, fans did not fall all over themselves to praise it. And after that first round of reviews, no one is talking about this game. So what the hell happened? 
Why did everyone forget about the Outer Worlds? Well, I think it's about time we address the elephant in the room and dig in, shall we? Fallout is this game's great grandpappy. Before this game was a warm, tickly feeling in the developer's pants, Fallout was showing every Western RPG just how big its dick was. Fallout lived and breathed player freedom. In the mission in Necropolis, where you finally find the water chip, you find that the ghouls are using it to filter their own water. And if the player steals the water chip without repairing the water pump, he's basically leaving them to die from thirst. The player from this point is left to make their decision. Steal the water chip, or repair the pump and take the chip later. The quest, if played all the way through, has two stages. Stage 1 is repairing the pump. The first thing you must do is navigate your way past Larry and Harry, a super mutant of low intelligence. To do this, you could simply dazzle him with your high speech or do essentially the same thing by having the intelligence of a summer squash. Barring that, you can stealth past him or try your luck killing him. The killing him option being the least desirable, of course, simply because you likely don't have power armor at this point and Larry, Harry, and his friends have rocket launchers and plasma rifles. Either way, there are several solutions to this problem. Once you're in the back room, you can either plumb the depths of the sewers to find a pile of junk to repair the pumps, or if you got some junk already from the hub or somewhere else, repair it without doing any of that. Once that's done, the player can now steal the water chip with a clean conscience. Or they can decide at the start that they don't care about the ghouls, and steal the chip without repairing anything, and skip past that part of the game. The game gave you a choice to make all this easier on yourself. It wasn't worried about you missing out on content. It had different priorities. It was trying to offer expression of choice found in pen and paper games, or emulated as closely as it could. Outer Worlds doesn't even come close to doing that. Okay, wait, let me, let, me, let me record a bit of a correction there. It comes close to doing pen and paper 5th edition style, where the player is never actually in any kind of fucking danger, and every single encounter they come across, they just fucking curb stomp. That's sort of the problem nowadays, even pen and paper fucking sucks. With the Outer Worlds, you get a similar situation in which you are tasked with finding a power regulator for your ship. The town of Edgewater has one. In fact, it is in the basement of the canning facility, unguarded, just waiting to be stolen. Problem is, the game doesn't like the idea of you stealing it and scampering off into space in search of adventure. No, it needs to exercise its own control. I say, am I not entitled to be a dickhead if I want to be? No, says the man from Obsidian. You have to do the quest as written. And right there, in the very first mission, you get the whiff of a fart you won't hear ripped until you are hours into the game. The reason you won't know it's coming is because the game, it presents a good first impression. To your average waypoint hunting player, nothing will seem amiss. They will happily follow the objectives, and at the end of the mission, they'll pick up the option that they like the most. To let the town starve, let the deserter starve, or bring them all together and kick out the incompetent boob Reed Thompson in favor of a strong female lead who's got all the right stuff, including a crazy whacked out theory that decomposing organic material can help feed nutrients to plants. Ah, she's a whacked out broad, but it's an idea that works. Now before we get into the hows and whys, let's look at Fallout and Outer Worlds design to see if we can identify what works and what doesn't. Now there are a couple of things going on here. The first, most notable, is the structure of obstacles between you and the various tasks. Harry and Fallout can be tackled in several ways as the game is incredibly open that way. You can use speech or a lack of intelligence to confuse him, or you can sneak past him or grind your way into beating him and his super mutant buddies in a fair or not so fair fight. The reason working your way past these guys is such a good obstacle is because the challenge level is very likely far beyond anything the player can handle at the moment. So talking your way past them or sneaking past them feels like a great accomplishment because to do anything otherwise would mean to have to fight them and likely end in your death several 
freaking times. The speech skill in a game is only as fulfilling as the difficulty an encounter would introduce without it. The same can be said for using sneak to get past a difficult encounter, or using the repair skill to do something instead of fighting someone, and instead, in Outer Worlds, everything is so damn easy to kill that the option to not fight an enemy feels like it's there for flavor instead of serving any mechanical purpose. Then there's the three-option faction questing. In Fallout, the objectives are not the highlight. The highlight is more in how your character tackles these objectives. In Outer Worlds, the highlight is this three-choice structure. Now, this type of design is okay for a quest or two, but when every major quest follows the same structure, it sort of lulls you into a hypnotic trance where decisions are being made based on pattern recognition instead of being confronted by an incredibly tough decision that forces you to think about the best outcome. Now take The Witcher 3 for an example of how you can combat this. I'm not saying the game does it well, mind you. In fact, I think it did it terribly, but it did work to make the players stop and think about their actions. Early in the game, you are confronted with many decision branches, and one choice usually sticks out as the best one. Release a tree spirit to save some kids, then BAM! The evil fucking horse demon kills an entire town and scarpers off with the kids never to be seen again. You fool me once, game, fuck you. Fool me twice, can't get fooled again. You see, you start to recognize the red herring quest design, so instead of picking the option you think is reasonable, you go with the one that you think the designers worded in a way to trick you. With Outer Worlds, it is much more simpler than that. There's a choice A, which is not great, there's a choice B, which is also not great, and choice C, which is the best of both worlds. Now, that sounds like choice, but it really isn't. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I'm willing to bet that most people did not side with the corporations as they were bumbling idiots, and the deserter faction didn't seem to have the ability to lead on their own without help. So I'm willing to bet that most people opted to merge the two interests most of the time, and if they went back in for a second playthrough, they might have tried siding with one faction over the other, only to find out fairly quickly that this didn't seem to alter the game world in any significant enough way to make the effort of a second go-round worth it. Tyranny, on the other hand, handled choices like this fairly well, in that nearly every choice you made had a good and bad side to it, and it forced you to make the best of a bad situation, either based on the morals of your character, or your own morals. I can't tell you how many times the game had me sitting and reviewing choices I could make, agonizing over the choice I knew the character I was roleplaying wanted to make, over the choice that would have most likely resulted in the most appetizing outcome for me, the player. Not to mention that tyranny, unlike a game like Outer Worlds, major choices matter in a very noticeable way. And take a look at this graph, which you can find on tyrannygamepedia.com. Depending on how you approach the end of Act 1, you can fight alongside the Disfavored, or the Scarlet Chorus, or side with the enemy, the Vendrian Guard, or, for those that seek power for themselves, seek to claim the power of the artifacts in various towers, drawing the eyes of jealous factions, and perhaps the big bad eye of Kairos herself. Pissing off any one faction loses you access to that faction's quest, giving ample reason for a player that found enjoyment in that world to play through the game again to see how things could have ended differently, to see the conflict from a different point of view. It's really a genius game. The other reason that Tyranny felt like it had meaningful choices is because the game constantly reminded you that your character did this thing, or that thing, or betrayed this faction, or killed these people, and because of that, you can expect no help from such and such person, place, or thing. God damn it. That game was so good I still have a milk mustache from blowing it so much. Outer Worlds, on the other hand, gives you three choices without consequences or the agony of trying to decide the best, least destructive course of action. Every quest ends like the ending of Deus Ex Human Revolution, picked between three flavors of meh. Let's take an unassuming quest from Fallout as another example. Rescuing Tandy from Raiders. Now, you may think that there's only one way to rescue her, and that's to run in, guns blazing, and kill everything that moves on two legs. And that might be true for a game like Outer Worlds, but Fallout ain't like that. In fact, the Raiders won't attack you until you say something stupid to the wrong person. Here's all the different ways that you can complete this mission. You can kill everyone and that will be hard, but it's a very rewarding proposition because they have a ton of good loot. You'll need to be fairly well equipped and high level, however, or have some very good traps set up. You can challenge Garl to a fist fight for her release, or you could straight up purchase her, if you have the money. 
You could puff out your chest and demand he release her, and if you got pectoral titties for days, he might just be scared enough to let her go. You could sneak into the back room and pick her lock to her cell. There's even an option, which I didn't know existed, I had to dig this up on a wiki, that allows you, if you have a luck of nine and a stealth boy, to bluff the raiders into believing that you are Garl's father, who Garl killed to seize power. There's some other less obvious ways as well, but ask yourself, does Outer Worlds allow you to pose as the ghost of a dead man to fool a group of people into releasing a hostage? Does it? I think not. The faction system is what suffers the most, and here's why. It just simply doesn't matter. First off, say you take the power from Edgewater and doom the town. You would expect that Spacer's Choice would be pissed and maybe send hit squads after you. Or ban you from ever setting foot in town again, send a squad of soldiers in and pacify the rebels, but nah. Nothing like that ever happens, because the game explains that shit away by saying that all the corporations are barely staying upright, which makes places like Byzantium really hard to explain. I mean, if there's nothing on Edgewater worth saving, then why do you continue to leave people down there? If they're expendable, and you're willing to just let a band of deserters move in and overthrow you, why are you upset when they do overthrow? It just doesn't make any sense. And more so when you find out that the only reaction that a corp has to you fucking with their bottom line is making items and vending machines more expensive. Okay, once again, a choice is only as meaningful as the odds that you're up against. If they're insurmountable in some way, then that choice is very meaningful. If they're not, who the fuck cares? I don't think I have ever been reliant on anything that has come out of one of those vending machines. So the deterrent the game has for pissing off the corpse is one of the least noticeable punishments. It has no impact. The other thing is that once you piss off a corporation, you no longer have to deal with that specific corp anymore. See, if you piss off Spacer's Choice enough, they'll attack you on sight. Same with all the other corporations. Now that might sound like a bad thing until you realize that once you leave Emerald Vale, you never have to see them again. So let's recap. At the end of each major faction mission, you're left with a decision that will either endear one faction and piss off another, or make both factions happy. If you opt to piss off the corp, it's okay because they'll never see you again, because they are only on that one planet. And there's no real reason to go back to a planet once you've completed the mission, so while you do get increased prices in vending machines, that is about the only penalty. But let's talk about the actual factions themselves. Fallout New Vegas did many things right, but the best thing it did was nail the factions. NCR was an expansionist government, well organized, well funded, and looking to bring freedom and democracy to the wasteland for the good of the people. At least that's what they'd tell you. But the reality is, is that profit's so much easier to make when the land you're making it off of is orderly. They were opposed by what is quite possibly their polar opposite, Caesar's Legion, or Kaisar, however you want to pronounce it. Now, NCR is not, on its own, an interesting faction. I mean, usually the good guy faction is only as enticing as their antagonist is vile, and Caesar's Legion is as vile and interesting as bad boy factions get. The first time you meet the Legion, it is on your way to see what has happened to a nearby settlement. When you get there, you hear about the lottery. Yeah! Who won the lottery? I did! Smell that air! Couldn't you just drink it like booze? <laughs> what lottery? The lottery, that's what lottery! Are you stupid? Only lottery that matters! Oh, oh my god, smell that air! <laughs> then if you're the inquisitive type, you might find a guy who got second place in the lottery. God damn it, I was nodding off until you barged in here, and I don't hurt when I sleep. You're looking at the second place winner of the Nipton Lottery. That asshole Swanick took first place. So him they let walk. It ain't like we came to Nipton to play it. Me and my crew had it worked out to kidnap some NCR troopers who come to town to get laid. Had it all worked out with the scumbag mayor. We were gonna ransom them off, keep their weapons for ourselves, a nice score. We get in position, and next thing we know, we're surrounded by those fucking Legion freaks. They dragged us and everybody else into the center of town. And that asshole with a dog on his head, he starts talking about how we're bad people. He said we needed to be punished for what we did. Not all of us, but some of us. 
and then he gives everyone a fucking lottery ticket. What do you think? He started drawing tickets and that's how people got punished. First up was the lucky losers. They got decapitated. Guess that's lucky cause it's pretty quick. Then came the crucifixions. God damn, but those went on and on and on. Third place runners up got enslaved. I got the fuck beat out of my legs and the winner they let go free. His prize for not losing was having his legs shattered in several places. His dynamite tossing friends were not so lucky however. They got crucified. And at the end of this long aisle of dying crucified men is the leader of this band of tribals and slaves, Volpes and Colta. Your first conversation goes a little something like this. Don't worry. I won't have you lashed to a cross like the rest of these degenerates. It's useful that you happen by. I want you to witness the fate of the town of Nipton, to memorize every detail. And then, when you move on, I want you to teach everyone you meet the lesson that Kaisar's Legion taught here, especially any NCR troops you run across. Where to begin? That they are weak? And we are strong? This much was known already. But the depth of their moral sickness, their dissolution, Nipton serves as the perfect object lesson. Nipton was a wicked place, debased and corrupt. It served all comers, so long as they paid. Profligate troops, powder gangers, men of the Legion, such as myself. The people here didn't care. It was a town of whores. For a pittance, the town agreed to lead those it had sheltered into a trap. Only when I sprang it did they realize they were caught inside it too. Yes, and herded them to the center of town. I told them their sins, the foremost being disloyalty. I told them that when legionaries are disloyal, some are punished, the others made to watch. And I announced the lottery. Each clutched his ticket, hoping it would set him free. Each did nothing, even when loved ones were dragged away to be killed. Yes, they did, as will all the rest of them in due time. Now go and teach them what you've learned here. There will be more lessons in the days ahead. Now, depending on your political leanings, you might see the NCR and think, Hey, I like them. They got the right idea. Or, you know what? We've tried this before and it didn't work. When you meet the Legion, you might be thinking, You son of a bitch! Or, you might be thinking, You son of a bitch! Now, Kaisar's Legion helps to define the NCR, as any good antagonist might. You see, the NCR seem on the surface to be a good idea. They promote freedom and democracy. But in a wasteland full of degenerates and desperate people, the NCR helps create places like Nipton, or at least allow places that are willing to whore themselves out to the highest bidder to thrive. Whereas the Legion keeps those base instincts in check by punishing severely the disloyal, the dishonest, the profligate. If the Legion were simply rabid dogs killing for pleasure like raiders, they would not create a conflict within the player as to whose side they're on. They would be a paper cutout version of a choice that has only the slightest sliver of depth upon looking into the profile. The NCR as a faction would be even more boring without them because the Legion extrudes that paper cutout and gives both factions depth. If the Outer Worlds, the corporations are played as buffoons who can't seem to do the simplest things right. Yeah, every colony you visit is in the midst of dying from one reason or another. Edgewater is dying because the ground is basically lava rock and nothing would grow there. You, the player, might start asking yourself, whose stupid fucking idea was it to build a settlement on a bed of lava rock? Then you might start asking yourself, if salt tuna is more salt and cartilage than tuna, what fucking idiot thinks they can survive on this? Then people start getting scurvy and still, no one is putting two and two together. Then when you find out that the deserters are able to grow their own food because they had the bright idea to use nutrients, something no numbnut asshole back in town thought of, you start to realize that the corporations either have to be willfully fucking themselves over, or they are collectively retarded. 
Okay, look. The plants aren't growing, so I'm pretty sure that the Brando's not working. Now, I'm no botanist, but I do know that if you put water on plants, they grow. Oh, well, I've never seen no plants grow out of no toilet. Hey, that's good. You sure you ain't the smartest guy in the world? The game tries to explain it all away by saying the corporations banned books and free thought and encouraged a bogus religion to corral people like sheep. But the fact still remains. The corporations put idiots in charge of trillions of dollars worth of investment in a colony so far away from Earth that no one will be able to retreat should it fail. The corporations are the foil to people who would rather live off the land in symbiotic relationships. So, who I wanted to side with was the people who seem smarter than the obviously incompetent boobs who are quite literally killing the colonies off through sheer stupidity. But the game desperately clutched its pearls and did this to me before I could make my choice. Do you understand what you're about to do? Yeah, I thought I understood until you started flapping your lips around. I don't think you should cut off Edgewater's power. I think it would be cruel. I I'm sorry. That just sort of came out all at once. Hey, do you like Parvati? Did you maybe want to get to know her character better? Well, the game's sitting here telling you in no uncertain terms that she thinks that shutting off the power to Edgewater is cruel. Why do you think the game's doing that? Let's keep watching. Edwater's hurting. We've been losing workers year after year, and corporate hardly ever sends replacements. There's barely enough Saltuna to fill our bellies anymore. But the town's got some good people in it. Decent, hard-working folk just living their lives the only way they know how. They don't deserve to be punished. I never met a single person in the town that met that description. Maybe if I had, I might not have been siding with who I am siding with, bitch. I mean, everyone I've met up to this point has kind of been a dick, or depressed, or fucking dying because the corporation refuses to save their lives. You are telling me, Parvati, that this is a system worth saving? I mean, didn't your dad work himself to death over this exact same shit? I mean, what the fuck is with this game? Miss McDevitt's built something beautiful. Somehow, she's talked the ground into giving life again. It's plain to see she's made the Vale a better place. Fed the hungry, tended the sick. Gave a home to those that had none. But Miss McDevitt delights in Edgewater's suffering. She wants to hurt the town. Do you really want to be party to that kind of hatred? So here's the thing. Parvati says that Adelaide delights in seeing the town suffer. Does she, though? Maybe she wants to see the collapse of a system that killed her son, through sheer incompetence. Maybe she's tired of obeying like a slave. You, the player, most likely knew this, and were about to divert the power to the garden until this conversation. Now, I'm sure some of you did it anyway, but some of us, like me, were swayed. Not because it made sense to do so, but because the game was hitting us over the head with a fucking hammer. The game was quite literally shouting at us what the most pleasing outcome would be. It needed us to side with the corporations. It wanted us to know that we could bring both sides together, but we needed to listen to Parvati to do that. Obsidian probably noticed in their user experience testing that no one ever sided with the corporation, and instead of maybe giving the corpse some, I don't know, depth, they decided to use our companions against us, to guilt us into a decision we wouldn't have made otherwise. It is yet another reason this game doesn't stick out in my mind, because the game was driving me around, not the other way around. It was telling me what the right decision was instead of letting me come to that decision on my own, and letting me live with the consequences of my actions. Ever since Fallout went from 2D turn-based to first person, I've had a problem with the combat. It's not because it's bad, mind you. It's because the challenge of the game goes right out the goddamn window, and the challenge has always been the main reason why Fallout 1 was the game that it is. See, there's a lot of different ways to design challenge in a combat system. But when you're basing your combat off of a skill as opposed to tactics and ability roles, you start to see limits in design. For instance, in a game like Borderlands, where it's all about your quick twitch muscles and your ability to aim, it is possible to fight an enemy way over your level by being intelligent, peeking corners, or exploiting the AI until you've whittled the enemy down over time like calcium-filled water eventually builds a stalagmite. The only limitation here is that you'll likely run out of ammo before you can kill them, 
but I wouldn't say that type of combat provides a challenge if you're skilled at shooters or even building a good character. With turn-based combat systems, you are limited by your stats, your gear, your buff items, and so on. If the game designers are smart, they make gear and buffing items rare and valuable so that players have to work to get them, as well as only using those items in the most direst of situations. If you make the items rare and therefore expensive, those items can be incredibly strong. So look at the drugs in Fallout for a good example of this philosophy. Then for a bad example, just open your inventory in Outer Worlds and look at the sheer numbers of garbage, food, and drugs you have in your inventory. None of them are terribly useful because all of them are overabundant. In Fallout 1, combat never played out the same way twice because of the randomness involved and because of the wide array of combat skills. You could do some really interesting things with dynamite and grenades, but at the end of the day, if you were outgunned, outnumbered, and outleveled, well, you were likely dead. And some of the encounters early on are real roadblocks, like the raider camp outside of Shady Sands. You would be hard pressed to do anything about them in the early levels, and would likely need to come back and take care of them if you wanted the free Tandy. If you remember before what I told you about the Raider mission, you'll likely remember the sheer amount of crazy options available to you. But why were those options there, and why were there so many? The answer's simple. Because the encounter is way too hard for a low level, and those options are there to give the player a way to do the mission without killing everyone, or dying 20 times before getting some lucky rolls. That philosophy of not killing anyone is carried through the entire game because the designers knew that some people wanted to play as a smooth-talking, intelligent nerd boy who talks, crafts, or hacks his way out of everything. They may not have intended to have Jesus runs, but even the final boss can be talked into killing himself. Also, if you've played Fallout, something you might have noticed is that when walking into a camp, the raiders don't attack you on sight. You know, unlike the Outer Worlds. See. I've seen no-kill runs done in Outer Worlds, but oh my god did it seem like a pain in the ass. If you go into a main quest dungeon, chances are everything is hostile and everything wants you dead. So the solution in Outer Worlds is to sneak or run past everything. Whereas in Fallout, you have the ability to talk to people from start. In a game like Fallout New Vegas or Outer Worlds, you might only be able to talk to the leader of a given faction, and that's only after you've killed all of his people. There's a difference between these two styles of games, and it's a difference that's as wide as the Grand Canyon. The fun of Fallout was based on how you overcame obstacles, and the fun of Fallout New Vegas and Outer World comes from how many things you can kill, and how you kill them. It just isn't the same. In Fallout, you had those options around to not kill everyone because the chances were combat might kill you because you were a flesh bag of liquid and bone, and one shot from a handgun left tangible holes in you. So the game left you options to talk your way out of difficulty because it was an actual RPG. And because the combat was difficult, talking your way out of shit felt good. In the Outer Worlds, you're given great weapons right away, fully auto assault rifles, grenade launchers, and great big tanky armor off the first few encounters. Whereas in Fallout, you live with leather armor until you got lucky or saved up enough caps. And because caps were fairly rare early on, the chances of you getting combat armor were pretty thin until you got to the hub and did some gambling, or just got some lucky drops. You were also lucky any time you found ammo for your weapon, or a better weapon. The chances are you'd have no ammo for that upgrade and would be stuck using your old pistol until you went shopping. Fallout made you work for everything. Every milestone, every achievement. Outer Worlds rewards you for maintaining a body temperature in the upper 90s. Combat is far too easy in the Outer Worlds. On the hard difficulty, you'll be mowing groups of enemies down without breaking a sweat, and if you make use of cover or stealth, you'll be doing this without taking damage. And to add insult to injury, the game gives you options to skip fights in dungeons because they want you to feel like you could do a pacifist run, and you can, but, but if you aren't, I have to ask, what is the point of these options? Like, in the geothermic station, the robots are programmed to kill anyone that isn't a robot. Yet another callous decision brought to you by Spacer's Choice. So they are naturally hostile to you. That means you either need to kill them or sneak past them. There's no penalty for killing them. So you would be forgiven for going in guns blazing because these robots are insanely easy to kill. 
But then you find out halfway through the mission that you can simply reprogram their targeting so they kill one another. And that would be useful in a game like Fallout, but here it's worthless because you have likely already killed most of the robots in that place without breaking a sweat before you even got to that option. A similar situation presents itself in Fallout when you're on your way to the crater called The Glow to retrieve some data for the Brotherhood of Steel. The further in you go into the facility, the nastier robots start appearing, and these guys can cause you serious issues, especially if you don't have plasma or heavy weapons. An option to turn those fuckers against each other is actually useful instead of pretend useful. It doesn't feel fulfilling. So you can give me 20 different options for bypassing a challenge, and I won't care, because the most entertaining option is always also the easiest. Now, after more than 20 minutes of bitching, you might think I hate this game. I don't. I needed to write this video because it's been nearly 6 months since it was released, and I haven't thought about it since I beat it. I enjoyed the game the first time I played it, but I couldn't point to one single experience in the game that made a lasting impression on me, and all attempts to go back and replay the game in a different way was met with apathy, unlike with New Vegas where just the act of writing this video has me doing yet another playthrough with the bad boy faction. I've seen dumbing down trends coming for sake of mass appeal, and unfortunately it looks like they're here to stay. I guess we'll all have to wait for Larian to blow our minds of Baldur's Gate 3 before we get another actual taste of an actual RPG. Or just go back and play old games. I guess my frustration comes from a place where Triple Atom is capable at this point of making the greatest traditional RPG experience that we've ever seen, but the investment would not cover the sales. And being that it's left up to the indie and middle market to fill that gap, most companies take the genre too far in the other direction, a la Disco Elysium, a fantastic, well-written game that is quite literally an adventure game gussied up to look like an RPG. Give me an isometric turn-based RPG, goddammit, and don't tell me to play Kingmaker. Cause I'm already doing that. Now, thanks for sticking around, my druggies. Make sure to click that bell so you know you actually get a notification that I uploaded shit. And also follow me on that Twitter place. I will be doing uh, more live streaming and uh, probably be posting a bunch of audiobooks there. So, um, and I'll bo most likely be streaming some uh, game design stuff. So, yeah, anyway, updates get posted on Twitter, so, you know, go check that out. And now for the shameless begging. I need a dollar, dollar, a dollar is what I need. He he. Well, I need a dollar, dollar, a dollar is what I need. He he, and I say it I need dollar, dollar, a dollar is what I need. And if I share with you my story, would you share your dollar with me? Do it! Just do it! Don't let your dreams be dreams. Yesterday, you said tomorrow, so just... Do it! Make your dreams come true! Just do it! Some people dream of success while you're gonna wake up and work hard at it. Nothing is impossible! You should get to the point where anyone else would quit and you're not gonna stop there! No! What are you waiting for? Do it! Just Do it! Yes, you can! Just do it!